rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world, and then shall the end come. Tell us, when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Well, good afternoon, everybody, and I want to welcome you to Tuesday's edition of End of the Age. I'm Dave Robbins with End Time Ministries, and I want to thank you for joining me today. And I've got a kind of a unique program. I did this um, several months ago. And man, everybody just loved it. They, uh, I, I told them, I said, if you want to copy this program of this question and answers program, uh, email me and I'll send you a copy of it. And I mean, my email exploded because we specialize here at End Time Ministries, Irvin Baxter, myself, and all of us, we specialize in the prophecies of the Bible. And so over the years, we have got thousands of questions uh, from people who, you know, we, either we didn't answer the question, they didn't understand something, they wanted a little more in-depth um, understanding of it. So they, they, they call us. I talk to people all day long. They read our magazine, watch our radio, television programs, different things, and they just want to know more. So I've got so many questions over the years. So what I'd done a few months ago is I went on and I did a program, Q&A, questions and answers from people from all over the world and some really, really good questions. And because it was so popular, I had a lot of people say, Dave, you ought to do that almost quarterly. And so I thought I would do that if I get enough questions, and if they're obviously different questions than the one before, I thought I'd do that. And that's what I'm going to do today. Um, I've got about 35 or 40 questions here. And in an open line segment, uh, like we do open line on Fridays, you, you might get 12 or 14 good calls, uh, and you can answer 12 or 14 questions. But in a Q&A program like this, it's really informative, and I might get through 30 questions or 35 questions. So it's, it's really informative, and our goal here is to teach and to really help people understand the prophecies of the Bible and some areas of the Bible that's not prophecy. We get questions from people. Of course, we just don't deal in prophecy. Prophecy is mainly what we focus on. It's about 30% of the entire Bible, but there is the other two-thirds biblical foundational principles that people want to know about as well. How to get to heaven and all these tons of different questions. And so what I'll do, if you email me, drobbins at endtime.com, if I get enough questions, I might do a program like this on a quarterly basis because they're, it's so informative and you'll learn things that you, you possibly didn't know before. Now, many of you, most of you are very educated I talk to you on the phone all the time. I know that. I mean, you guys have been studying this for years and are very up to date and, and, and very informed. Uh, however, uh, there are some things that um, some people, just, they just can't wrap their mind around. I, you know, you guys have said this for years, but I just don't understand this. Well, send me your question and I'll do these Q&A sessions periodically to try to help everybody out on some of these questions that some of them you wouldn't even think to ask. But they're very informative, and if you're really into research, these things will really help you. And so that's what I'm going to do today. I've got, like I said, about 35, 40 questions, and I'm going to see how many I can get through on today's program. And it, it's, I love doing this. I, we do it in our Bible studies all the time. We'll have Q&A sessions afterwards. And even now in the prophecy conferences that we do, uh, on, on the Sunday morning session, we'll have a Q&A from the crowd and it's always, it's always hugely popular because people have questions that we might not cover on the air or in one of our videos, something they've studied for years. And so uh, these have always been real popular. So uh, here we go. Uh, we'll start off. We'll do a Q&A today. And uh, if you want a copy of this today's program, that my notes, all these Q&A with the answers, um, email me, drobbins at endtime.com. And if you want a question answered on a future program, Email me, drobbins at endtime.com, 
And uh, now if, if you say, hey, Dave, why is this spaceship sticking out of my bedroom window? Okay, I'm probably not going to answer that. However, if it's, an, if it's a, a regular question that will help somebody out, then we'll put it on the program and I'll answer it. So without further ado, let's get started and see how many we can get done today. So question number one, Dave and Irvin, do you feel that the real ID is the mark of the beast? We get this question all of the time. Well, the answer is the Real ID Act, which basically changes your driver's license into a national ID card. Um, and it is, it's basically to be fully implemented by, right now, the final implementation date is 2020. Basically, we see this as a precursor to the mark of the beast. Uh, we know that to take the mark of the beast, that um, there, you, you would never want to put a mark in your right hand or in your forehead, and you would never want to pledge allegiance to the Antichrist or his global governing system. But the way there's the precursors to this is they're already starting to number people on the earth, the, the earth's population, by giving them all national ID cards. Most nations on earth already have a fully functioning national ID system that is um, compulsory. You don't really have a choice. You have to have that to function in society. Most nations on the earth. And so they're already starting to number people, but they haven't, there's not biometrics tied to it. They have, it's not under your skin or, you know, on your forehead, this, that, and the other. They don't have your, your retinal scan attached to it. So national ID cards are, we see as precursors to this system. So what's going to happen? The Antichrist will eventually use identification numbers to economically control individuals, forcing them to pledge allegiance to or worship him and his world governing system. So the real ID is, we see it as a vehicle to usher in the mark of the beast, but obviously we're not there yet. The mark of the beast will not be doled out until the Antichrist comes on the scene. And so that happens at the, you know, halfway through the final seven years, it's not being implemented yet. That's why we're watching precursors, the move towards a cashless society, uh, people already taking chips under their skin now. I mean, I'm talking about thousands of people worldwide. They're already putting chips under their skin. Uh, invisible tattoos, national ID cards. These are all precursors leading us up to a time when the Antichrist will dole out the mark of the beast. So at this point, no, the real ID is not the mark of the beast, but it's a precursor to that system. Question number two uh, states, hey guys, I'm sure you have done research on the origin of the name of Jesus and our, and our Savior's name, Yeshua. So why do you guys call him Jesus? Well, there are, there are actually people on earth that believe that you should actually baptize in the name of Yeshua, not Jesus. Okay, so, and we've had this question. That's why it's on here. Well, here's the, here, here's the explanation. Yeshua and Jesus are the exact same word. Yeshua is the Hebrew pronunciation and Jesus is the English pronunciation. For example, if a person's name is Yossi in Hebrew, it would be pronounced Joseph in English. It's the same word. So if your name is Yehuda in Hebrew, we had a, a guide forever, uh, for 20 years plus in Israel. His name was Yehuda. Well, Yehuda in Hebrew, it's going to be pronounced Judah in English. It's the same exact name. So this happens because in the Hebrew language, it has no J and no V. So a J becomes a Y when you move from English to Hebrew. And a V becomes a W when you move from English to Hebrew. So when you move from Hebrew to English, then you just reverse that. That's why Jehovah in English is Yahweh in Hebrew. But it's the same exact word. And that's why Jesus is pronounced Yeshua in Hebrew. But it's the same word. So if you're a Jewish person, uh, baptizing an individual, uh, you would say, I now baptize you in the name of Yeshua. But if you're an English speaking person, you say, I now baptize you in the name of Jesus. It's the same exact word. If you were a Hispanic individual, you would say, I now baptize you in the name of Jesus. But it's the same exact 
word, same name. Uh, it's just if, in different languages. And so uh, it's, it's, a, it's a, a, a very, it's a common uh, question that we've had here because we get, you know, I get questions from all over the world. People want to know, how should we baptize? What's the formula we should baptize in? And so um, it, that's, you know, it, it's a very uh, common question. And I just thought you might want to hear the answer to that uh, because it's, it's kind of unique. Question number three. When does the judgment seat of Christ occur if there is a post-tribulation rapture? Of course, we believe in a post-tribulation rapture. If you've heard this program for any time at all, you already know that. So I won't go down that road today. But uh, because there is a post-tribulation rapture, this individual wants to know, when does the judgment seat of Christ occur? Well, according to Revelation 11, 15 through 18... Which, let me read that real quick, because it's, it's very important that you understand. Revelation 11, 15 through 18 states, And the seventh angel, so this is right here at the second coming of Jesus Christ. The seventh angel uh, sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And the four and twenty angel, elders, which sat before God on their seats, fell upon their faces, and worshiped God, saying, We give thee thanks, O God, uh, God, our, O Lord, God Almighty, which art and wast and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and hast reigned. And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come. When the wrath is coming, it's talking about the second coming of Jesus Christ and the battle of Armageddon. And the time of the dead that they should be judged. We're talking about the judgment seat of Christ. And that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. So when does the judgment seat of Christ occur? When the dead are judged and the prophets or the saints are given their reward, it occurs just after the seventh and the final trump at the second coming of Jesus Christ and at the battle of Armageddon. That's when the judgment seat of Christ... It's different than the great white throne of judgment. Two different things. So it's very important that you understand the judgment seat of Christ. When the saints are given their rewards at that time, that's at the second coming of Jesus Christ in the battle of Armageddon, just after the seventh trumpet sounds. Question number four. Do you believe that there will be a rapture of the church? Well, absolutely. But there are, I've had people call me that say, Dave, you guys say there's going to be a rapture, but the word rapture isn't in the Bible. Well, I understand that the word rapture isn't in the Bible, but we have the, 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 what we're referring to when we say the rapture is the catching away of the church, uh, being caught up in the air to meet the Lord. It's, it's, it's in several places in the New Testament. So, yes, we absolutely do believe in a rapture. And if you look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 and 17, and I want to read them too, because it, I want to read this scripture as well, because it's very important that you understand why we believe in a rapture. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 and 17 says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. So 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 through 17, among other scriptures, absolutely proves that the church will be raptured or caught up to meet the Lord in the air. Yes, we absolutely do believe in a rapture. Number five, um, the, the question number five. I'd love to call your show, but being in Australia, I'm probably way out of the right time zone. I'm having a group over very soon, and we will be discussing the end times. I wish to mention your work and your resources. In the meantime, I think you've mentioned a number of biblical things that, might, that must come to pass before Jesus returns. Where could I find a simple point-by-point -point list of, of prophecies that would come to pass prior to the second coming of Jesus Christ. Thanks for all of your amazing work. Well, I, I have a, um, if you go to endtime.com, there's an interactive prophecy timeline. And, and really what a lot of people have done 
is just email me drobbins at endtime.com and I have an, a, a, an electronic interactive timeline concerning end time events that will show you what happens between now and the second coming of Jesus Christ. It's, it's a huge timeline and it shows all of the events that happens at the beginning, what happens at the middle, and what happens at the end, and everything in between. So if you just email, email me at um, drobbins at endtime.com, I'll shoot you a copy of this chart because it's very, very cool, and it gives all of the prophecies to occur between now and the second coming of Jesus Christ. Uh, because some people think all this stuff's already happened, but that's simply not the case. And I'm, I think I'm actually in the future going to uh, answer a question about that. But... Um, Email me, drobbins at endtime.com, and I'll get you a copy of the chart. It's very cool. I've sent thousands of them out uh, because people really like it, and it's interactive. You scroll over it, scriptures pop up. It's really neat. Um, so question number six. Can someone who has not received the power of the Holy Spirit be raptured? Actually, no. Romans 8, 11 states, But if the Spirit of Him that rose Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. So if at the time of the rapture, when the trumpet sounds and God sends his angels to gather his elect, if, the Bible says, if the same spirit that rose Jesus from the dead dwells in you, in the form of the Holy Ghost, dwells in you, then your body will be changed and you will be caught up to meet him in the air. That's the, that is a, that's an absolute must. And so it's a, it's a requirement. So no, a person who has not been filled with the Holy Ghost, not been born again, will not go up in the rapture. It's impossible according to scripture. Uh, question number seven. I have heard you and Irvin say that the first five trumpets of Revelation have already sounded. You understand that there's the seven trumpets in the book of Revelation. I've heard you guys say that the first five have already sounded and that we are waiting on the sixth one right now. Is this true and what are they? Well, I don't have time to give you all of the proof for each one because I'll never get through half of my questions. But the, the simple answer is this. The first trumpet was World War I. We have proof for that. The second trumpet was World War II. The third trumpet, which you understand that the trumpets, when the tr this angel was given a trumpet, when it sounded a particular event in time would occur. Well, these began to be sounded at World War I, 1914 to 1919. World War II was uh, the second trumpet, 1939 to 1945. The third trumpet was the Chernobyl nuclear accident, which occurred in 1986. The fourth trumpet was the speeding up of time and the tearing down of the, with the tearing down of the Berlin Wall, in our opinion, the process of globalization started, everything took off uh, really rolling and time just really sped up. And that was about 1989, uh, tearing down of the Berlin Wall. And the fifth trumpet occurred with the, um, in 1991 with the uh, Iraq War against Saddam Hussein. So those would be, in our opinion, the first five trumpets and I tell you what, because I don't have time to give you all the proof, I don't want to leave you hanging. Um, for a conclusive proof of each trumpet, uh, it, I would recommend that you really, I'm not really, I didn't come here today trying to sell you stuff, but you can order the Seven Trumpets DVD because it's the most effective. I could get a whiteboard out here and write all the proofs down, but until you saw all the video clips and every, all the, the guys teaching and all the proofs that we have, it's really hard to kind of understand. So the Seven Trumpets DVD, order it online um, or call in here, 1-800-END-TIME and order it. And it gives all of the proofs for the first five trumpets. And then it lets you know specifically the sixth trumpet is the sixth trumpet war, which is a war and we could be fighting it as we speak, but it's a future war that will kill one third of the world's population. And then, then of course, the seventh trumpet is the last trump and we're all out of here at that point. That's the second coming of Jesus Christ. Uh, when he raptures the church and um, we, we, we go with him to fight at the Battle of Armageddon. Uh, question number eight. How can I receive the basic steps to survive a nuclear disaster that you mentioned on the radio, you've mentioned several times? Well, um, 
in the near future, we're going to have a section devoted to spiritual and physical disaster preparedness. But if you email me, drobbins at endtime.com, I've got a, a list of stuff I can already send you uh, that can help you prepare physically for a, uh, a nuclear disaster. Now, obviously, if you're at ground zero, we'll see you on the other side. There's no surviving that. But if you live on the outskirts of a town, there were people in Hiroshima and Nagasaki that survived the bomb. Now, obviously, ground zero, no. But on the outskirts, there are people that lived. There was actually one guy who survived both bombs. He was working in Hiroshima. The bomb went off. He jumps in his car. He heads to Nagasaki to tell his family. That's where his family was from. He survived that bomb. So he, and he wrote a book. He survived both bombs. And so um, there are ways to greatly increase your chances of survival. I have some of that information. Email me, drobbins at endtime.com. Say, Dave, I want the World War III preparedness stuff you have, and I'll forward it to you in an email. Won't charge you a dime. Question number nine. If seeds can be sown for the Battle of Armageddon and the Prophecy College uh, in Jerusalem, because we have a lot of our efforts focused on Jerusalem, obviously, all around the world, but we do have a, a particular interest in Jerusalem. We have a Prophecy College there, and we focus a lot of, a lot of energy there. Um, the question says, then why don't you guys sow the seeds of truth in the United States by subscribing all of our governors and congressmen to End Time Magazine. It might make them stop and think. Um, and if you don't think that's a good idea, let me know why um, in your next letters to the editor column. Well, the thing is, is that that's actually a very good idea. We do spend a lot of time and effort in Jerusalem, but we are, we, we're, we're inundating the world with this message. We've got a huge platform that God has given us and this is one of the ways that we've done it. What you've suggested is actually, actually a very good idea. And that is why, thanks to many of you for the last several years, um, and many of the presidents of the, the United States, every governor, congressman, as well as most of the kind of the movers and shakers, Sarah Palin, Rush Limbaugh, Glenn Beck, Alex Jones, many of others of these have been, we, you guys have subscribed them to End Time Magazine. And believe me, we've got, we've got um, great feedback from them. I, got, I, I, I wrote an article here a while back about um, the climate change, the global warming that leads to climate change was a hoax, and that basically um, the Pope's encyclical was written to promote this huge disaster, climate change, global warming, and at the end he said the solution was a call for a global government, a global political authority to manage all of this. Well, the goal behind the global warming climate change scam, hoax, whatever you want to call it, is to move the world into this world governing. It's one of the ways they're doing it, uh, along with immigration and all this other, the move towards a cashless society. It's one of the ways they're using to scare everybody into conformance into this one world governing system. Well, uh, I wrote this article and, and stated all of this in great detail. I went through all of the parts in the Pope's encyclical that he put out. I think it was in June of 2015. And showing how that basically he's scaring everybody to death going throughout this whole encyclical. And then he's calling for a global political authority to manage all of it. Well, I wrote this. We sent this to all, to all the senators, congressmen, the governors, everybody. I had a sitting U.S. Senator, sign his book, send it back to me, and it said, Dave, thank you for having the courage to tell the truth. Because of people like you and me, we're going to win this fight, your friend, so-and-so. <laughs> I won't give you his name on the air, but it, you would recognize him. I mean, he's very a prominent figure. He sent me his book and said, thank you for telling the truth, because he agreed with me 100% what they were trying to do. All that was a result of all, a lot, many of our partners subscribing all of these, um, all of the movers and shakers in the United States to End Time Magazine. They just don't pitch it in the trash like a lot of people have said. No. Some of them are reading it and taking it to heart. So number one, thank you because you've helped us do that. That's one of the platforms that we use. And so uh, this question sent in by this lady was a, a great idea. 
and we've actually been doing it for years. So thank you for that. Uh, question number 10. Why do you believe that the interim peace agreement will be between Israel and Palestine? Well, all of the issues prophesied to be in the agreement in Daniel 9, 27 are the very issues presently under negotiations between the Israelis and the Palestinians. They include the, Palestine, uh, the creation of a Palestinian state in Judea and Samaria, which is the modern day West Bank. Um, also allowing the Jews presently living in the West Bank to remain as a Jewish minority in the new Palestinian state. All of this has been proposed uh, by Netanyahu. He's willing to leave those people out there if we have a two straight uh, solution in the near future and placing the Temple Mount under a sharing arrangement uh, which that's already been proposed. There's a law proposed in the Knesset on the books right now to place the Temple Mount under a sharing arrangement um, just like the Hall of the Patriarchs in Hebron uh, down in southern Israel. That's placed under a, a, a supervised sharing arrangement between the Arabs and the Israelis. It's the same thing they're proposing to do with the Temple Mount. So all of that, <coughs> everything that's supposed to be in the agreement has already been proposed between the Israelis and Palestinians. Um, and so that's, those are three of the main things that lead us to believe that Daniel 9.27 will be between the Israelis and the Palestinians, along with several other things as well. Um, I tell you what, I'm coming up to the break here, and I want to make sure that you guys get all these questions. I'm going to answer a bunch more of them in the second half. So if you're listening to us on a radio station that just carries the first 30 minutes, when you get home tonight, we archive these programs. Go to endtime.com www.endtime.com and you can watch this program live or archived um, on, right there on there. You'll, you'll see my picture, click on it. You can watch the whole program because I just got through 10 questions and I've actually got 35 and I'm going to try to get through as many as I can. So endtime.com to watch the rest of the program. End Time Ministries has taught countless Bible studies about prophecy. One of our favorite places to teach is on the Mount of Olives, where Jesus will soon return, the Temple Mount, where the Third Temple will soon be built, and overlooking the Plain of Megiddo, where the Battle of Armageddon will soon be fought. Being in the place where prophecies will soon take place brings them to life in a breathtaking way. In other words, our favorite place to teach prophecy is while on our Israel Prophecy Tour. You can be a part of it. Join Irvin and Judy Baxter October 27th through November 7th for a life-changing trip. For more details, go to endtime.com or call 1-800-END-TIME. Sign up today. Time is running out. There's a specific prophecy in Daniel chapter 11, verse 32 and 33. Listen to it. And such as do wickedly against the covenant shall he corrupt by flatteries, but... The people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. And they that understand among the people shall instruct many. So right while the Antichrist is corrupting people with his false doctrines and with his flatteries, yet there's going to be a people who are strong for God. They're going to do exploits. And their assignment is the ones who understand should be instructing others who don't understand. To order End Time Ministries bestseller, Understanding the End Time, call 1-800-END-TIME or go to endtime.com. If your station does not carry the full hour of End of the Age, go to endtime.com to hear the conclusion of today's broadcast. Well, welcome back, everybody. And of course, I'm going through a question and answer session today. Uh, these are very effective in helping you in your research and different things. Um, and a lot of these questions, some people don't even know to ask. But they're, they, they really help when you go to understanding the Bible and different things, uh, different things going on in the earth today that pertain to prophecy. A lot of these questions will help you. So if you have a question in the future, email me, drobbins at endtime.com. And I'll help you out. I'll, if, if I don't know the answer, I'll get with Irvin. If he doesn't know the answer, we'll do some research and see if we can't figure it out. And if, if nobody knows the answer, we'll simply say that we don't know. I'm not afraid to do that. We don't claim to know everything, but we will teach what we do know. 
and can document. And so that's where the answers to these questions come from. So if you got a question in the future, email me, drobbins at endtime.com. And if you'd like a copy of today's, of my notes from today, all the questions, doesn't look like I'm going to get through all of them. Uh, I'll send you a copy of that. Uh, anything I have, I'll send you guys and uh, do the best we can to teach you guys, um, you know, the prophecies of the Bible and the other parts of the Bible as well. So, so important and critical in the times just ahead. So, okay, without further ado, let's take off. Question 11. Uh, have any of the end time prophecies already been fulfilled? Absolutely. Number one, the rebirth of the nation of Israel, Ezekiel chapter 36 and 37, is a, is a prophecy of the rebirth of the nation of Israel prior to the second coming of Jesus Christ. It's, already, it's obviously already happened. The nation is sitting over there um, on the Mediterranean Sea today. The, number two, the opening of the first four seals of Revelation chapter 6, verse 1 through 8. Zechariah chapter 6, verse 1 through 8 tells us that these are four spirits that will dominate the belief systems of mankind just prior to the second coming of Jesus Christ. So the, the white spirit, which is, a, I've seen, I've heard of movies that they've got four horsemen riding down through her, the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Okay. In the near future, there's not going to be four horsemen riding around, a white, red, black, and green one, okay? Because Zechariah tells us that these are spirits that go throughout the earth controlling the thought processes of men just prior to the second coming of Jesus Christ. So the white spirit, Catholicism in the world today. The red spirit, communism. You've heard of red Russia, red China. The black spirit is capitalism. And the green spirit is now Islam rising in the world today. So those are the four thought processes um, or the four spirits going throughout the earth to control the thought processes of men. Revelation chapter 6, verse 1 through 8. Zechariah chapter 6, verse 1 through 8. And it's absolutely amazing that the colors of the four horses in the prophecy perfectly match the official colors of the world's foremost belief system. Think about it. In the world today, all the belief systems in the whole world, these four spirits pretty much... There, there may be a few little religions out here and this, that, and the other that don't, but most of them come under the ideologies of these four entities, Catholicism, communism, capitalism, or Islamism. Number three, these are prophecies that have uh, already occurred that pertain to the second coming. The sounding of the first five trumpets, of course, I already went through that, Revelation 8 through 11, the first trumpet, World War I, second trumpet, World War II, the third trumpet was a Chernobyl nuclear accident. Fourth trumpet uh, was a shortening of the days at the Berlin Wall, 1989. The fifth trumpet, 1991, uh, with the Iraq war with Saddam Hussein. Uh, obviously, for if you want a complete explanation, which, like I said before, I don't have all the proofs. I don't have time to give you all that for the five trumpets. Uh, we have end-time DVDs and different things. Uh, we've wrote articles on them um, called the seven trumpets, okay? And then, of course, the fall of the Berlin Wall uh, was prophesied in Scripture, on, and it occurred on November 9th, uh, 1989. That's in um, Revelation 13, 3, uh, just to name a few. So there's already, that's why we, when we get on here and we have a sense of urgency, it's because many of the prophecies pertaining to the second coming of Jesus Christ have already occurred. They're not ahead of us. They're behind us already. We do have a few to go yet. But we're, we're, we're not hundreds and hundreds of years away. We're living in the end time. And that the answer to that question right there, have any of these already come to pass? That's one of the ways we use to prove that. Uh, question number 12. Will we spend time on earth after the battle of Armageddon? Well, there actually will be humans which are not taken in the rapture who will live on into the 1,000 year reign of the kingdom of God here on earth. That's Daniel 7, 12. Their dominion was taken away. The nation's dominion were taken away, but their lives were prolonged for a season and a time right there at the second coming of Jesus Christ. However, those that are raptured at that time, they will rule over the earth as kings and priests with God as immortals. They will be changed from mortal or the ability to die to immortal during that time and will rule and reign as kings and priests with the Lord for that thousand year period. So there will be humans that are allowed to live into that 1000 years. You say the question always comes up. 
Who is that? Well, we don't know 100 percent, but there is kind of a uh, an example in the Old Testament. You remember when the, the um, Israelites came out of uh, bondage uh, from Egypt? They're out in the wilderness and they're going to go into the promised land because of the sins uh, that they had committed murmuring and complaining and different things and unbelief, they weren't allowed to go into the promised land. They died. The Lord said they're going to die off out in the wilderness. But the children 20 years old and down will be allowed to go into the promised land. So there was an age of accountability in the Old Testament. You say, well, are you guys saying 100 percent that that's what's going to happen uh, at the time of the second coming, that everybody 20 years old and down is allowed to go into the the, it live into the millennial reign? No, I, I don't know that 100%. It's the only example in the Bible that we have that would kind of give us a little precedent as to well, what's going to happen. But there will be people that live into the millennial reign, humans here on earth for that 1,000 years. Uh, we do know that for sure. But those that are raptured at the time of the second coming, they will, they will rule as kings and priests with the Lord in His government here on earth for that 1,000 year period. Question number 13. Could the deadly wound happen to America? You say, well, what in the world is the deadly wound? Well, in Revelation chapter 13, it describes a world governing body. Uh, and it's a beast with seven heads. If you've followed us at all, you understand what I'm saying. Well, the seven heads on the beast, one of them was wounded. So, no, it can't happen to America. Why? Because the deadly wound, uh, the, the, um, four of the seven heads is Germany representing the four Reichs. First, second, the third, Hitler's third famous Reich, and then the fourth Reich, which is now rising. So the deadly wound that was the division or the, the wound that was healed um, was in Germany. It was the, the Berlin Wall that was built after World War II. It was like a rusty knife wound through the, na the heart of the nation. So the healing of the deadly wound was the tearing down of the Berlin Wall, which occurred on November 9th, 1989. So the, the, uh, I've had people say, no, the Antichrist was wounded and he's going to come back to life and all this stuff. No, it's not, it's not what it's talking about. The beast, the, 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 the beast in Revelation 13 is described as two things. It is representative of the world government and the Antichrist when it refers to the beast in the first few verses. So when it says the beast that was wounded nigh unto death, but it was healed, the wound was healed, it's referring to when the Berlin Wall was torn down because the heads on the beast represent nations. There's the lion, which is Great Britain. There's the bear, which is Russia. The four heads of the leopard, which is Germany. And the ten horned beast, which is the, the, Holy Roman, or the, the Holy Roman Empire revived, which is the current European Union. So the head, that, the, the head or the nation that was wounded was the, the, um, the, the third head of the leopard, which was the, the Berlin Wall. When the Berlin Wall was torn down, the wound was healed. It went away. We started the process of globalization. We moved, we moved um, straight off into um, the, the, the New World Order. A lot of different things happened right there uh, at the tearing down of the Berlin Wall when the wound was healed in Revelation 13. Number, question 14. Um, is the new pope the false prophet? Well, we actually don't know the answer to that yet. Whoever the Pope is during the reign of the Antichrist, that's going to be the false prophet. We don't know if, if, if it's Pope Francis. I think he's, what, uh, 85, 86 years old. So I don't know if it could be Pope Francis. Will he last that long? I don't know. But who, we, whenever, the, whenever the Antichrist is revealed at the abomination of desolation, when the Antichrist stands in a rebuilt Jewish temple and proclaims to be God, when he's revealed, the Bible says uh, that he is revealed at that time, whenever he's revealed... Whoever the Pope is at that time, that will be the false prophet. We'll know that 100%. At this point, we simply don't know. Uh, question number 15. Mark 13, 10 says, And the gospel must first be published among all nations. So do you believe that this part has been fulfilled? No, we actually don't. Um, however, it will happen before the Lord returns. According to Matthew uh, chapter 24, verse 14 it states, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. So that hasn't happened yet, but before the second coming of Jesus Christ, it absolutely will happen. And we're believing that entities like ours and other entities 
will promulgate the gospel all around the world prior to that. There's missionaries all over the world. They're all doing a good job. And the, Jesus actually said in Matthew 24, before the second, before I come back, this gospel will be preached unto the whole world and then the end will come. So we're right there at the end. And of course, we know through television, all the different media outlets and different things that are out there, we're getting the job done, but we're racing the rapture. We need to get it done. We need to do more. Uh, and of course, your partnership helps us do that. And so we, we thank you for that. And um, if you can give more in the future, please do, because it expands our reach. And so that helps us out greatly. Uh, a, lot, a, a lot of people will never have the platform that God has given us. So a lot of our partners say, well, hey, I, I, you know, I'm, a, I'm a, a, a in construction. I do this, but I'll help you guys because that's, your, that's what God's called you guys to do. And we have thousands of awesome partners that help us do what we do here every day. And so we're very, 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 very thankful for that. And we thank each and every one of you very much. Uh, for all of your faithful support through the years. Uh, question 16. Please explain the two Sabbaths that occurred the week that Jesus was crucified. Well, you know, you have a lot of people that say, well, hold on, there's Good Friday. And Jesus was crucified on Friday, went in the ground Friday night, yet he rose on Sunday. And I scratch my head and I'm like, well, well, hold on a minute. The Bible says he was in the ground three days and three nights. How does that work? Well, during the Jewish Passover, the day of Passover, it's a special Sabbath. It's called a high day. You can read it, John 19, 31. Well, this results in two Sabbaths occurring in the same week. So the first Sabbath started on Wednesday evening, and the second Sabbath was the regular Sabbath, which occurred on Saturday. So Jesus was crucified and buried on Wednesday before the first Sabbath began, and he rose early on Sunday morning, the, the first day of the week. It's Mark 16, 9. And he, so therefore, he was, in the grave, he was in the grave Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Three days and three nights. Because there were two Sabbaths that week. Um, not, he, he didn't go in the ground Friday night and raise on Sunday. And miraculously, it was three days and three nights. He went in the ground Wednesday. So it's, I got, we get that question a lot, believe it or not. Um, and I'll try to get one more before we go into the, into the break. I'm, I may not. Let me just hold off on this one because uh, it's a good question. And again, if you want to copy of my program today, drobbins at endtime.com. It only looks like I'm probably going to get through about 25 of these questions. Uh, and I've got 35 or 40 of them. I don't know for sure. So um, email me, drobbins at endtime.com for any of the information I went over today. And I'll send it to you email. 1 Chronicles 12.32 states, And of the children of Issachar, which were men that had understanding of the times, to know what Israel ought to do. Jerusalem Prophecy College was created to educate the Jewish people concerning the prophecies that will come to pass in the near future. But why stop there? We want to give everyone this opportunity. That's why the online learning portion of the Jerusalem Prophecy College has been created, designed for students who desire to participate in the program but cannot attend the physical college in Jerusalem. With the online program, you can study from the convenience of your home with the flexibility to accommodate your schedule. Jerusalem Prophecy College helps to train a core group of leaders who can effectively minister to others in the end time. The next semester begins Monday, September 5th. Go to JerusalemProphecyCollege.com to register today. That's JerusalemProphecyCollege.com. Okay, everybody. So I'm going to dive right off into this because I'm going to try to get as many of these I can done today. I'm on number 17 and I've got you know, like 35 or so. So I'm going to try to get as many as I can done. So I'm going to, I'm going to shift it into overdrive here. So just stay with me. If you're keeping notes and you can't write as fast as I'm talking, email me and I'll send you a copy of my notes. That way you got it all because these are such good questions. And, um, you guys I, I, email me drobbins at endtime.com if you got a question and we'll do this again because this is a blast. I, I learned from researching from this stuff. It was so cool. So uh, email me if you want to get a question answered on the air and uh, see if we can't help you all out. 
Question number 17. You say, you guys, Irvin, Dave, say that the Jews are to flee to Jerusalem, but other Bible scholars say that they will flee to another place such as Petra when all this stuff starts coming down. So please direct me to the Bible verses that say it will be Jerusalem. Well, yeah, I actually get this, believe it or not, I get this question a lot. People say that when the, the abomination of desolation occurs, that Israel is actually, the, the Jews living in Judea with the West Bank, they're going to flee across the Jordan River down into the southern part of Jordan to Petra, which has got like this little, uh, it's, it's like a two mile long walk down a, a cavern that's about 100 feet deep. It's, and there's places, I've been there, you can actually stick your hands out and touch the sides, both sides. It's like four or five foot wide. And when you get down in there, there's this little place that's got like a carved out church out of stone and stuff. You could probably put 800 people there safely. The problem is in modern day warfare, that would be a death trap. Petra would be a death trap for the Jews because one bomb dropped into Petra, it's going to kill everybody there. It'd be a complete death trap. That would be a suicide mission for them to flee down into Petra. And because the maximum population, it's about 800 people. There, uh, there's hundreds of thousands of, of Jews, settlers, living out in the West Bank now. So that, that's, that would be a suicide mission for them. So what's going to happen? Well, Revelation 12, 14 states that uh, concerning the tribulation period, and to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness into her place. Uh, where she is nourished for time, times and half a time from the face of the serpent. So since the woman in this chapter in Revelation 12, um, with the 12 stars around her head is Israel, and her place is obviously, what's Israel's place today? It's the promised land. Then we can then deduce that the settlers will not flee into Petra, but they're going to flee into Israel proper. Revelation 12 tells us that. If you look at a topographical map of Israel, Jerusalem is in the mountain range on the west side of the Jordan River. So the Jews would be crazy to flee away from safety, the safety of their promised land and flee into, flee into Jordan. It would be a suicide mission. Israel is and always will be the safest place on earth for the Jews, uh, for the Jewish people. Furthermore, Zechariah 14, 14 says that at the Battle of Armageddon, it states this, and Judah will also fight at Jerusalem. So they're not going to be hiding away down there in Petra. They're going to be in Jerusalem fighting with their brethren. The Bible specifically tells us that in Zechariah. Uh, so, at the, so at the time of the Battle of Armageddon, the Judeans or those settlers who have fled from Judea, the West Bank, they're going to flee into Israel proper down to Jerusalem, and they're going to be fighting there. They're not going to be hiding away in Petra. So I get that question a lot. You guys say that they're going to be in Jerusalem and Israel. Others say they're going to be in Petra. You know, who, who's right? Well, it's not necessarily who's right and who's wrong. It's what does Scripture say? That's what I'm going to go by. That's what Irvin goes by. And, and, and so I'm going to search the Scriptures. I'm going to see what they say. And if, if we know what they teach, then that's what we're going to teach. And so from the Scriptures, that's what we believe is going to happen. Question 18. I recently heard Irvin say, if Israel signs the peace treaty by April 2014, he said this on some of the programs, then would they, they would then usher in the seven-year tribulation. Maybe I misunderstood, but I thought World War II occurred before the tribulation. Well, actually, that was a misunderstanding. He didn't say that the signing of the peace treaty, which, of course, that hasn't happened, but this is, a, this is what I wanted to answer. Uh, it didn't happen at that time. But it, we, it didn't say that the signing of the peace agreement would begin the Great Tribulation. That's one of the reasons I wanted to give you guys this, the answer to this. Because there's no such thing as a seven-year tribulation. It's the final three and a half years of that final seven-year period. There is a final seven-year period, but the tribulation only lasts the final three and a half years of that. Irvin actually said it would begin the final seven years to the Battle of Armageddon. So the Great Tribulation begins halfway through the final seven years at the time of the abomination of desolation. Look in uh, Matthew 24, 15 through 16. 
Jesus said, when you see the abomination of desolation occur, let them which be in Judea flee, for then shall be great tribulation. So the abomination of desolation happens halfway through the final seven years, and the final three and a half years is the great tribulation. So the tribulation will last uh, that final three and a half years. Several scriptures prove this. Daniel 7, 25, Daniel 12, 7, Revelation 11, 2, 11, 3, and 12, Revelation 12, 6. So it's not, it's not a seven year period, it's a three and a half year period. Sometimes the Bible will say that it's 42 months. Sometimes the Bible says 1260 days, and then sometimes it says time, times, and half a times. All of those are three and a half years, uh, which is the length of the Great Tribulation. The Six Trumpet War is going to occur before the Tribulation, but we don't know if it will take place before or after the signing of the peace agreement. Uh, so you may have misunderstood his, uh, what he was saying on that program uh, at that time, but it, it's a lot, of, a lot of people have that question, and so that's why I wanted to bring it and answer the question on the air. Uh, question number 19. Do you think that the dragon mentioned in Revelation 13, 2 is China? N actually, no. I, I know that in the news, China is referred to as the dragon a lot. But according to Scripture, if you look at Revelation 12, 9, it tells us exactly who the dragon is. It says that the dragon is that old serpent, the devil, and Satan. So really, it, it, I don't have time to prove all of that today. But if you want to get a good explanation of that, look at the master plan of the dragon. and It'll give you a, a, our DVD, Master Plan of the Dragon. Uh, and it gives a complete explanation of all of that on that DVD. Because I'd, I wouldn't, that'd be the last question I get to today if I explained all of that. But the dragon in Scripture is Satan. It's not China in, in uh, the book of Revelation. Question number 20. Do all Christians that take the mark of the beast lose their salvation? Absolutely. If you see Revelation uh, 14, 9 through 11, anybody who takes the mark of the beast will spend eternity in the lake of fire. So if an individual who calls themselves a Christian, but yet somehow succumbs to that, takes the mark of the beast, pledges allegiance to the Antichrist, um, they will not. You say, well, hold on a minute. A person can't lose their salvation. That's something that we'll need to talk about in the future. Um, that, you know, the Bible, the Bible actually does say a person can lose their salvation. And I've got scriptures to prove that. If you, wanna, if you want scriptures for that, email me drobbins at endtime.com and I'll give you the scriptures for that as well. Um, question 21. Could President Obama be the Antichrist? Well, President Obama is presently pushing for a one world governing agenda. He's pushing for that, the one world governing agenda of the Antichrist. He is. He absolutely is. He's a globalist. Tearing down the borders, uh, wanting this uh, a global community to answer, to answer to a one world governing authority. He's pushing for the world governing, the government agenda of the future that the future Antichrist will rule over. However, we do not believe that, the anti that, that Obama can be the Antichrist. The Antichrist must come from the Holy Roman Empire, which was reborn um, in Europe on November 3rd, 2009. And so we do not believe that the Antichrist can come uh, from the United States. He's going to come from the revived Holy Roman Empire, which is the current European Union. Uh, question number 22. Why do some people refer to God as God and others call him Jesus? Well, many people refer to God in different ways. Sometimes they call him Lord, my Lord. Sometimes they call him God. Sometimes they call him the Heavenly Father and sometimes Jesus. So Jesus is the proper name of God in all of his attributes. Matthew 1.23 describes Jesus as Emmanuel, which means God with us. So Jesus said, I am come in my Father's name. So Jesus, God, my Lord and Savior, uh, Lord, all of that, you're still referring to the same entity there. And that's, uh, I come in my Father's name. That's found in John 5, 43. Um, question 23. Why do you teach that Daniel 9, 27 is referring to the Antichrist, the he there? Well, the he... The Bible says he will confirm a covenant with many uh, for a seven-year period. The he, 
of Daniel 9, 27 is going to do three things. He's going to confirm the covenant. He'll cause the sacrifice and the oblation to stop. And he will replace, he will place the abomination of desolation. So Daniel 11, 31 clearly states that the Antichrist will take away the daily sacrifice and place the abomination of desolation. So as a result, we can be sure that the he of Daniel 9, 27 is the Antichrist. It's very clear. Question 24, should I buy gold to sustain my family during the tribulation? And I've had, I had a lady call me a while back that said, hey, Dave, I've got $100,000. I just retired. What, can, what stocks and this, that, and the other can I buy to set myself up, pay my property taxes all the way through the next several years? What can I do to set myself up for, to make it through the Great Tribulation? Well, we're, we're not financial advisors. That's a decision that you're, you're going to have to make that for yourself. I can't, we don't even know what the economy is going to look like in another three or four years. But whatever you do decide to do, do not put your trust, obviously, in gold and earthly things. God has promised that he will, he's never going to leave us. He'll never forsake us. So the number one thing is to have your trust firmly in the Lord. And then you'll have to make a decision with what you guys do with your money. That's not something we can advise you on because we simply don't know at this point. There may come a time when we can say, hey, you know, do this, the barter system, whatever. At this point, we simply don't know. Question number 25. Could America be the little horn mentioned in Daniel 7, 8, since it's not mentioned in Revelation 13? Uh, well, no, America can't be the little horn because the little horn comes up among the Ten Kings, the Ten Nation Alliance that will come from the Holy Roman Empire, which is located in Europe. And so if, if you, you know, I don't, I don't have time to explain all of that, but if you want a complete explanation, again, we've got a DVD, Holy Roman Empire Reborn. It explains that the, um, the, the, there's a Ten Nation Union that will come alongside the Antichrist and work with him just prior to the second coming of Jesus Christ and that's the revived Holy Roman Empire, um, which has already been reborn. It's the current European Union. The Bible says that he uproots three of those horns. So it lets us know conclusively that he comes from the reborn Holy Roman Empire, which is the current European Union. And so uh, I got to question 25 today, folks. I've got another 10 questions. If you want a copy of them, email me, drobbins at endtime.com. And I'll let you have uh, anything, I, anything that I went over today. Uh, I'll send you a copy of my Q&A, uh, the charts, any of the things that pertaining to World War III prep. Uh, give, me a, give me an email and I'll, uh, I'll reply to it. is a production of End Time Ministries. This broadcast will be available on our website, endtime.com, in the archive section. On our website, you'll also find more information about how current events are fulfilling Bible prophecy. To reach our operators, call 1-800-END-TIME. That's 1-800-363-8463. End Time Ministries is partner-supported. We would like to say thank you to our partners who made this broadcast possible. To do what Matthew 24, 14 said, to reach the world with the gospel of the kingdom.